forward. Okay, we are on the air. We will be starting shortly. We're just going to let those people who are joining us live get the notification that the Hangout is about to start. So thank you all for those of you that are starting to tune in. We're going to be having a photo focus, perfectly clear Hangout today, and we're going to be talking about wildlife photography with our guest, Scott Bourne. We're just going to wait about two minutes while we let folks come on in and join us, and we'll be starting here in just a minute or so. We'll just give folks a second to join. We'll be starting in just a moment. For those of you joining us, we're going to be taking a look at wildlife photography and uh, have our guest Scott Bourne with us here in just a second. So thank you all for tuning in. We'll be beginning here in just a moment. We're just going to give people a chance to log on in. They should have got their invitations and starting to come in now. So thank you guys so much for tuning in. My name is Rich Harrington and joining me is going to be Scott Bourne in a moment. We're going to talk about making compelling wildlife photography, giving you some expert advice as well as some tips that will work for all levels of users. So we'll be starting in just one minute. Those of you tuning in, thank you. We welcome you here to the Google Hangout. Remember, during the Google Hangout, you are welcome to post questions in the question and answer pod. And we'll have an opportunity to take a few questions of Scott during his presentation. So. If there are things you'd like to know about wildlife photography, you can feel free to put those into the Q&A pod. You'll need to be watching on the website or using the Google uh, Plus Hangout app in order to do that. If you're just watching the YouTube movie, you won't be able to ask those questions, but uh, feel free to visit the page if you'd like to put some questions in, or just think really hard, and we'll see if we can get it through telekinesis. <laughs> started. Thank you guys all for joining us. My name is Rich Harrington. I am the publisher of PhotoFocus. And joining us today on this Hangout is an expert guest, one of my mentors in the founder of PhotoFocus, actually, Scott Bourne. And I'd like to, before we begin, just thank the folks over at Perfectly Clear. They make a really cool plugin that enhances images. We'll take a look at that towards the end of the Hangout. But uh, Scott's going to share all sorts of great advice about making compelling wildlife photos. So Scott, welcome. Hey. And uh, why don't you tell folks a little bit about your background? Well, I've been making photographs for four decades and uh, my favorite photographs are always animals or birds, critters. I like critters of all kinds. And uh, I really started embracing wildlife photography after I got tired of doing people photography so long. And it turned out I get along better with the birds. So that's why I ended up sticking with that. But I've got pictures of uh, birds and wolves and bears and other stuff today that I'm going to show. And I just want to talk real generally uh, about wildlife photography and just go through it start to finish. At the end of my presentation, Rich is going to jump back in and he's going to take over some of the more advanced things you can do in post with things like smart objects and working in Lightroom. I'm going to be working in Photoshop today when I do my perfectly clear stuff. Perfectly clear is the plugin I use for all my images and it, I do it from Photoshop but it works from Lightroom and uh, Rich will show you that part a little bit later. So I'm going to get started and share my screen. I have. Yep. Uh, and while Scott switches that over, folks, uh, I'm just going to put my mic on mute. But feel free to ask any questions that you have in the Q and A pod or in comments on the page. And occasionally, I'll get a chance to interrupt Scott. If you hear people screaming in the background, I'm currently in San Jose, California. I've been visiting Adobe this week, and apparently, people like to protest hotels here 
or a union <laughs> issue. This, this happens every day at lunchtime, which I wouldn't have known before we scheduled the hangout. So I'm going to put my mic on mute, but those screaming people are not yelling at me or Scott or you. They're mad at our hotel. So Scott, your full screen. Welcome and uh, fire away. All right. Okay. There's, uh, there's my Twitter handle if you have any questions for later. Also, this slide presentation will be available through slideshare.net and posted alongside the replay of the webinar over at photofocus.com sometime in the next few days, I assume. So check out over there or just tweet me and I'll, I'll give you the link as soon as it's available. So uh, I'm going to kind of do a couple of things where I talk about some of my images I like and then cover some of the topics you need to know if you're interested in this sort of photography. This is probably my most famous photograph. It's Cranes in the Fire Mist. I shot this at Bosque del Apache, New Mexico. Uh, it's a wildlife refuge in central New Mexico. And I made this image after more than a dozen years of seeking it out because to get this particular conveyance of different things you have to have a lot about luck it had to had to have a perfect day to make this work we had to have sunny skies without clouds because otherwise the color goes purple and blue and green and to keep this reddish orange it has to be pretty much a bald blue sky and I had to get fog which means it had to be 32 degrees I had to get birds I had to get the wind going in the right direction I had to get the birds flying into the shot there was a lot to it I pre visualized this photograph so that's why it took so long because I was waiting for this exact shot. This was made with a three to eight hundred millimeter Sigma zoom, which I no longer carry because it's just too big. But that's how I got to the, the frame so full from a distance. It's a marvelous place if you get to visit Bosque del Apache. If you're ever in central New Mexico, I highly recommend it. Let's talk about what goes into thinking about doing this work without harming the animals. The first thing I want to suggest is be sure you know what you're doing, you know your subject, you know whether or not what you're doing can impact them. For instance, you'll hear a lot of old wives tale about photography of animals. Generally the stuff's not true, but you know, people will say you can't use flash around animals, which is absolutely not true, with one exception though. If you're photographing hummingbirds that are nesting and you use the flash, you can kill them because they're so overheated, just the heat from the flash can impact their lifespan. But short of something like that, extraordinary flash won't matter. There are regulations in the United States anyway that govern how close you can get to wildlife. Be sure you speak with park rangers if you're in a park to find out what those regulations are and then obey them. They're there for your protection as well as the animals and they can get you in trouble if you don't. You can usually accomplish what you need to by just following the rules. Whatever you do, don't do anything to endanger yourself or other people. I count, I've got countless stories of people going up to try to pet the buffalo in uh, Yellowstone National Park and they end up in the hospital or even worse. So remember, this is not a video game. Everything that happens in wildlife with wildlife, it, it, it can be serious. So don't get too close. Don't get out of your car around lions and tigers. Don't do stuff that's generally, you know, stupid. Don't do it. And be sure you respect nature. Don't, you know, trample on stuff if you can avoid it. Try not to disturb the environment any more than you have to. When we go into the areas that we photograph wildlife, we're going into these creatures' homes. We need to be respectful of that. Safety. Um, that's something you want to think about as well. <clears throat> if you're going to go out for the day, bring a little bit of food and water because you never know if you get lost, you get stuck. Do know how to use a map, a compass, and a GPS. And by the way, I carry an old-fashioned compass in addition to my GPS because if the GPS fails, the compass won't. North is always going to be north. And if you got a map and a compass and you know how to read them, which you can learn how to do usually in some community college class for free anywhere in the country, that'll help you. I do like to bring a cell phone and a satellite phone because I often go places where the cell phones don't work so that I can be in communication with anyone I might need to be if I need to be rescued or if I'm stuck. Uh, and very important to have that available. Make sure that you know the, the way in and the way out of every area you're getting into. Don't get caught in a place where you don't know how to get out. For instance, there is a little place called Ohanabakash up on Mount Rainier National Park. There's a footbridge in, and that's the only way out. I got trapped on that little island once by a black bear and could not get out because there was no, there was no way between me and the bridge to get there without the bear. So be, be careful. Know your ways in and out. Make sure you can find, hopefully, more than one way in and one way out. 
when you're getting close to these animals, do so safely. Don't make a lot of noise. Don't disturb them. Don't scare them. If you see any kind of animal with their young, be very, very wary, particularly cautious. Uh, do not run. Don't you know, that, that's a big mistake around things like bears and wolves because they may not be hungry, may not be interested in you. They see you running. It triggers a thing called prey response. They'll chase you just because they think they're supposed to. And the more you know about these subjects, the more you know about their habits, the more likely you are to be able to get close and still stay safe. Uh, just, just do your research. We have these marvelous tools online these days that can help people be aware of what they're up against. If you're dealing with certain animals that are particularly vicious, for instance, let's say a, a snow leopard, be aware that they can cover 100 yards in a matter of a couple of seconds. Don't risk your life and don't harm the animals. That's the simple way to approach this. Uh, this is a photograph I made years ago at Bolsky del Apache. It's kind of one of my favorite stories. We're going to look at this picture in perfectly clear a little bit later. But I made this on Walmart slide film, believe it or not. This is back in the film days, and my film did not make it the trip because the airlines lost my luggage. The only place to buy film within two hours of where I was was at Walmart. And I drove up there and bought the slide film and made this photo, and it's been very well received. It's been published a lot. So it just goes to show you, you can get by with less than best. First thing I want to talk about is uh, layered clothing. Now, I'm only showing one example here. And by the way, I'll have links to these things that will be part of this slide presentation so that you can go and look at them if, you, if you're interested in any of them. Uh, this is my favorite kind of glove. It's a fingerless glove. And I, I tend to work a lot in cold environments, so make sure you've got layered clothing if it's cold or hot because you can add or take away stuff as you need. Make sure you have comfortable socks and boots if you're going to be in the water in particular. Waterproof boots are really helpful. If you're going to be in the deep snow, you want to get boots that are rated to certain temperatures. You can actually check with the manufacturer and see what they're rated for. Always bring rain gear. Always, always, always. If nothing else, it'll stop the wind. So be properly geared up when you head out there with your own personal apparel before you worry about the camera gear. Here's another thing I highly recommend. If you're going to work around wildlife, you need to be working around sunrise and sunset, sometimes dusk and dawn. You need a way to light the path down to where you're going to shoot. Uh, I use these Petzl headlamps. I've had one of these, this particular one I've had for 20 years, and it still works. Works great. It's LED. It was very expensive 20 years ago. Uh, now they're, they're still the same price. They don't seem that expensive now. But something like, at the very least, a flashlight, some way to illuminate your path as you're walking towards the animals. And when it comes to lenses, <clears throat> excuse me, there's almost never a case where you can have too much lens. It's really simple. You've got to have a long lens to do most wildlife photography. Unless you're working in a zoo or a place that's very controlled where you get very close-up access, telephone lenses, telephoto lenses are a must. Now, the bad news, they're ridiculously expensive. The new big 500, 600 millimeter lenses, 800 millimeter lens. They're over $10,000 to buy. There's a couple ways to go about this. You can rent them from a place like lensrentals.com, especially if you're only going to do this work a couple times a year. Or <clears throat> you can go to this guy. I happen to think this is one of the best lenses for the money you can buy. Uh, I'm not sponsored by Sigma, although I've helped them sell many lenses, and I wish I were. I'm not. But this is their new 150 to 600 sports lens. It works on Canon or Nikon. And this lens is spectacular for under $2,000. It's crazy sharp. It's got great vibration reduction. Uh, it's heavy. That's the downside. It's definitely heavy. But this lens on an APS-C camera will, will get you out to, you know, roughly 900 millimeters effective focal lengths. It's very, very reliable, nice and contrasty. It's a little slow at f6.3 at the long end. That's what you're, you're saving your money on because to get that f4, f5.6 can be $10,000 more. So Stop if you're willing to make a sacrifice. This is your lens. You got a question, Rich? Yeah, before you move past that, so not everybody understands the sensor size thing there. You mentioned shooting with a longer lens on an APS-C sensor, which typically has a crop factor. A lot of folks have been hearing and messaging and camera companies have been pushing down our throats that you must have a full frame sensor. You actually prefer a lot of times not to. Can you explain the benefits just a little more? Yeah, I, I, 
I've made plenty of images before they were dealing full frame sensors into digital cameras and those images sold. So it's complete red herring. You don't need a full frame camera. In fact, it works against you in the wildlife photography business because you're always trying to get the frame filled with the subject and they're always way far away. So when you're using a crop sensor camera, you've got a crop factor that will cause you to have the apparent focal length. It's not technically the same, but it changes the angle of view such that it looks like you're using a 900 millimeter lens in this case instead of a six. And uh, that is really popular and, and powerful for wildlife photographers and bird photographers. We need to get close and it costs a fortune to buy these 800 millimeter lenses. Last time I checked on one, they're about $15,000. And I can name a number of cars I bought for less than that. So this is a way to get out there. You can buy a, something like a Canon Mark D7, 72, Mark, Mark II 7D version, um, you know, for under two grand. And you can buy this lens for under two grand. And for less than $4,000, you've got a legitimately pro quality wildlife setup. So, all right, let's move on. And you do need a modern day DSLR. You don't need the top of the line 1DX or D, you know, 4S, those are nice to have if you can afford them. But you can do something like this, the Canon 7D Mark II. This is a tremendous wildlife photography camera. There are Nikon equivalents. Pretty much any major DSLR will work that's been sold in the last three years. Frame rates are kind of important if you really want the best chance of stopping the action. Having the cameras like the 1DX from Canon or the D4S from Nikon where you get stupid high frame rates like 10, 12 frames per second really does help, but it's not necessary. And the good news is these newer cameras that fall into the $1,500 to $2,000 price range come at five or six frames per second, which way back in the day we thought was great. Uh, so that, there's, there's plenty of DSLRs that will do the job. I'd be more concerned about which lenses you're going to pick because the, the camera bodies, they're the least important part of the equation. Now, all the stuff I've been talking about is required. Now we're going to talk about recommended. You don't have to have these to be successful, but binoculars sure help when you're trying to find the game that you're, you're going to photograph. Looking for birds, looking for uh, wildlife. You can see them on a ridge with the binoculars and then move their, their way. And, and when it comes to binoculars, you don't want the cheapest thing because it's really hard to get them to perform. These are four or $500, these Vortexes. I've used them a lot. They're very reliable, they're very bright, and they're, they're very easy to use. Some people have trouble using binoculars because they're not used to looking through that kind of optical element. But this one is very easy to use. And if you've got the budget, go all the way up to Swarovski's because they really do perform at the highest levels, but they're also crazy, stupid, expensive. So you're going to spend four. If you can't spend 400 on a set of binoculars for this purpose, either rent them or don't buy them because you're probably going to throw your money away. So this is required. Why do we bring the binoculars out for the field versus just using the camera lens to spot things? Is it faster to focus? Is it lighter and easier to hold? It's yeah, all those things. Uh, you know, you've got a very limited field of view if you're looking through an 800 millimeter lens. When you're looking through the binoculars, you can zoom in and out and and use that to help acquire, particularly birds and trees. I find because if you sat there and scanned each tree with your 800 millimeter lens, you'd take an hour just to find something. With this, I can scan the entire horizon, look for movement, then zoom in with the binoculars, figure out where I'm at, and then get closer. Like I say it's not required, but it's helpful. Uh, again, not required, but helpful. One of the best ways to get close to wildlife and birds is from your car, because for whatever reasons, the animals don't see the car as a threat. They do see you as a threat. So I often photograph from my car. I simply use a bean bag over the window and I'll rest my lens on it. It's the equivalent of a tripod in a lot of cases. And uh, there are lots of bean bags at lots of prices. I like this particular brand. Uh, I've got a link to it here. It's actually very expensive. It's 120 bucks, but you can take and fill it and then unfill it using rice or corn husk or anything you want and makes it portable. So you can take it on an airplane without dragging 15, 20 pounds worth of stuff. And then you can dump it at home and, and it'll be portable, but it still works. You can rest the lens on the top cradle here. There are cheaper versions if you don't want to spend that much, but this is the one I use. It's very reliable. And I've had this one for, I don't know, 10 years. A gimbal head is also very nice. Most won't be familiar with this, 
a company called Wimberly sort of pioneered these, but the one I'm I'm suggesting people buy is about a hundred dollars or more less. It's called the the uh, Enduro GH2, or I believe that's the number. And, and this sits on top of your tripod. It gives you what looks like a machine gun turret that you can mount your big long lens into, and you can use these knobs and all these scales here to get the lens balanced so that if you walk away from it, it stays perfectly horizontal to the ground. And then you can simply move it with your little finger if you want. It becomes very stable, but also very able to track any moving subjects. Uh, these are very expensive, four or $500. Many people won't want to spend that for something they're only going to use a few times a year, so you can rent these. I highly recommend you play with one. If you've got anything 500 millimeters and up, it's really best to have a gimbal because unless you're Hercules or Thor, you're not going to stand there and handhold a 600 millimeter lens all day doing flight shots. Very few people can do it. I mean, I can two or three that I know. So consider a, Wim uh, a Wimbley or an Enduro head. There are even cheaper ones out there that I've done okay with. This happens to be my favorite in terms of price value. Also, if you're going to work outside and do wildlife, then it's going to start raining sometime. Sometimes it's going to start snowing. That's when the best shots actually come when you're in weather. And I like to have a very high quality uh, rain jacket for my big expensive lenses. This one has some holes you can put your hands into. Uh, it works very well. Uh, I've been using one of these for years, and it's made by the folks at Think Tank. They do a great job. And a teleconverter, because this gets you even more reach. Uh, these are high-quality optics. They're not cheap. You can buy the cheap Chinese knockoffs, but they won't do the job. All of the links I have here for Canon, Nikon, and Fuji teleconverters, all of these teleconverters allow autofocus focus to continue working. They allow all of the EXIF data to pass through to the lens, to the camera. So the camera doesn't change its character at all, other than you lose a stop of light but you do get the equivalent of a, a greater reach. So if you're using a 100-millimeter uh, lens and you throw this thing on there, now you're using the equivalent of 140 millimeters. It's just enough in some cases to make the difference. So, Scott, when you combine this with the crop sensor and the 600-millimeter lens, you're essentially getting focal lengths that are functioning around 1,000 or higher, but you really punch in on the action? Yeah, if you're at 600 on a crop sensor camera, that gives you the EFL of 900. Then multiply 900 times 4, that's another 360 millimeters. So you're at 1260 effective focal length there. Wow. <laughs> yeah, it's very cool. Now, one thing to know, though, that your lens technique at 1260 has to be rock solid. You have to be on a tripod that's heavy, heavy duty. You need a gimbal head at that point. You need to have everything locked down. You need to have good camera technique, know where to rest your arm on the lens, know how to keep your face pressed against the back of the camera. And any movement at all is going to be magnified tremendously at that focal length. It's very hard to get sharp images at that focal length unless you've practiced. So I do like to tell people if you're using these kind of lenses and these kind of devices for the first time, before you go on your big money trip to Africa or Yellowstone or wherever you're going, practice with seagulls in the park because you're going to want to have your technique down. This is not as easy as it looks. It does take practice. It took me several years to get good at it. Speaking of tripods, um, I, I, if you got the money, I would recommend really right stuff but they're two times more expensive than their competitors because they're made in America. They're very high quality. They're the best. But you can easily spend twelve to $1,500 on a tripod at Real Right Stuff. You can spend four to $600 on an Enduro, six to 800 on Gitzo. I prefer the Enduros from the price to performance ratio. Uh, if you've got the money, though, I prefer the Real Right Stuff. But the bottom line here is you need a beefy tripod. Get a carbon fiber one if you can because it'll be easier to carry. Uh, the one I have linked here goes to 77 inches and holds 50 pounds, and that's exactly what you want for this kind of work. You want something that's much, it's rated much higher than it needs to be in order to do the job because, again, that lens stability is critical to getting sharp images at these extremely long focal lengths. Most people are lucky to get a 10%, 20% keeper rate if they don't have good technique. This kind of beefy, heavy tripod will make sure that you have a better chance. Again, you can rent all this stuff if you don't want to buy it. And if you just want to try this out and see if you have any real interest in it or if you're any good at it or if it resonates with you, then then you can rent it first and then buy something. On that rental advice, though, Scott, I think you know you mentioned practicing in the park. I would be cautious about renting and you know getting it the day before I went out on the big trip. Oh, yeah. Right? You want to practice a few days? Yeah, I, I, I'm 
the good news is that most of these companies, like LensRentals.com, who you and I use, Rich, they tend to send you the gear three days before you need it. So um, that gives you pretty plenty of time. But I would I would certainly allow at least one full extra day, or maybe just rent it for the sole purpose of practicing a couple of weeks before you go out for the big event. Because the last thing you want to do is have spent thousand dollars to maybe go on a photo workshop and then get there and not know how your gear works because you're going to miss stuff. Um, camera bags that are capable of holding long lenses. Well, for years, I've used a certain bag to get my long lenses to the field. It was made by a company called Gura Gear, who recently bought out Tam Rack when they filed for bankruptcy. And now they've converted their name, Gura Gear, to Tam Rack. And this is their new bag that's coming out. And this will be the premium best choice bag to get a lot of gear, including anything up to an 800 millimeter lens, out to the field safely, comfortably, uh, not so much affordably because they're almost 500 bucks, but every camera bag's that, that these days. I would look, look at something like this if you're going to be traveling on regional jets. This will fit in a regional jet overhead, but you can pack an amazing amount of gear into this. And there are plenty of other camera bags you could look at as well, but make sure that they're capable of holding long lenses and make sure that you're carrying those long lenses with you on the plane if you put them in the, the cargo hold well you have more faith in the airlines and the baggage handlers than I do all right now let's talk composition by the way uh, this is a six week old mountain lion you'll notice that his eyes are blue and that's because at birth they are unable to see it takes four to six weeks for these these eyes blacken out and then they can actually see. So they all get born looking like this, like they have blue eyes, but that does change. Uh, this little guy is up on a crag above me on a rock and I chose to shoot up on him. This is part of the composition discussion because I, I know that someday he's going to be a magnificent mountain lion, kind of this massive, fierce creature. Now he fits in your shirt pocket, he's so small. So I wanted to shoot up on him to establish his dominance. I could have shot down on him. He would have thought he was a cute little kitty. This is the power of composition. Your point of view, the camera's point of view, can help the, the viewer tell the story they want to tell about the critter. If I'd shot down on him, they would have said, cute little kitty. I shoot up on him. Oh, he's going to be a ferocious lion. Something that simple, that nuance, can make the difference between an image that works. Basically, we're using the same standard rules of composition for wildlife photography with a couple of tweaks. Uh, the rule of thirds is always helpful as a guideline to figure out where you want to put your animal. You want to balance things. Look at the whole image and see if the, the things you've arranged in the photograph make sense. And one of the ways I do that is goes to the next step on the list, clean backgrounds. I tend to find my background first. I know that sounds counterintuitive, but if you find the background first and then you know the animal is going to pass through that background, you can get a clean shot and you can figure out how you want things to work. And at the end of the game, fill the frame is the name of the game. It's always safe to just fill the frame up with a picture as close as you can get of the animal's face or the behavior. Uh, you, if you fill the frame with the stuff we care about, the stuff we don't care about won't distract us. It's a compositionally important factor to know. And then, of course, shoot up for dominance, down for submission. I could spend two webinars just going over composition. Today, we don't have that kind of time. But these are just some basics to help you know what to do. Uh, technique. Uh, by the way, this is a coastal brown bear, which is a subspecies of grizzly bear, the largest grizzly bears in the world. This is taken up near Kaflia Bay, Alaska. That's the place where Timothy Treadwell of the famous Tre Treadwell Diaries was killed by these same bears. They get to be 12, 14 feet tall, and uh, they can run up to 35 miles an hour from a dead stop, and you can't. So keep that in mind. How to get close? Well, again, we go back to studying animal behavior. If you study the animals or the birds long enough, you'll figure out what they do. Certain birds, for instance, like to perch at the same place all day long. So they'll go out to get food. They'll come back to the perch with the food. They'll go out to build nest, get nest building materials. They'll bring that back to the perch. If you study their behavior and see where their perches are, you can move in on that perch while they're gone, set up in a bag blind or, or do something that like work from your car and you'll be able to get that shot. Studying the animal's behavior is crucial. The more you know about your subject, 
the better photography will be. And that goes for all types of photography. You want to monitor the animal's movements, figure out their habits and their patterns. For instance, you want to photograph eagles in flight. Well, eagles tend to defecate right before they leave the tree to go on a flight. So when you see them lift their rear tail, tail feathers and defecate, guess what? Very good chance they're about to take off. Then you can get that killer shot of the flight right off the branch. Uh, when you're moving, keep low and slow. Don't stick your tripod legs up in the air. You look like a giant prey mantis to the critters at that point. That scares the heck out of them, and they go running off. So move, move slowly. You have to be very, very patient. I think, Like I said before, shoot from a car. There's a thing called a bag blind you can buy from any number of sources online. It's basically a portable blind that you can put around yourself so you're shooting in camo. Uh, but moving slow and low is very important. Sometimes you'll think you're moving up on an animal and the animal doesn't react, so you're thinking you're cool. Well, trust me, the animal knows you're there and they're watching you some way. And if you get too close, too quick in particular, they'll spook. That's all there is to it. So you have to go very slowly. Most people don't have the patience to do this work. But if you can learn that patience, that can be the difference between getting a killer shot or not. Uh, believe it or not, I do have this photograph with wingtip to wingtip showing, but my slide program cut it off. Um, this is an eagle shot up near Homer, Alaska. Uh, I've taken Rich there, and uh, he came with some great shots. We had too many eagles in our shots sometimes. So knowing where to go is half the battle. I know where these eagles are. I know they'll be there every year at that same time. So it's not luck. It's planning. It's research, knowing where to work. You got lots of choices if you live in the United States. Uh, everybody lives within 100 miles of a park, lake, or river. That's just a fact. And uh, most people live within a couple hundred miles of a zoo and within 300 miles of a national wildlife refuge or a national park. So these are all great places to find wildlife. Doing research on the internet will give you the information that you need to figure out where the animals are that you're interested in. Uh, I always recommend that you get your chops down by starting at local zoos. You're going to see plenty of game, and, and you can work with it and practice and see what your strengths and weaknesses are. Then you're ready to go out to areas like the wildlife parks and the refuges where the animals are free, and you've got to chase them down. Again, be sure to follow the park rules and know where you're going. The so other thing, Scott, you, go in, ahead. The, in the world of wildlife photography and culture, do um, how do people feel about zoo photos? Is that the sort of stuff that people like use it for practice, but you really should never post those, or you know, is that up to the individual photographer? Do you feel an obligation to disclose when you're visiting a refuge, and you know they're easier to find, or is it just about making a good picture? What's your take? Um, you won't sell a zoo picture in most cases, uh, but. It's a great play to, to practice. And as far as identifying your photographs, uh, if they're taken under what we call controlled condition, it's often good to do that. It's, you know, it's up to any individual. I'm not the wildlife photography police. Everybody has to make their own decision. But um, if you're in a, in a refuge, Rich, or national park, that's as wild as it gets because that's where those animals were living before we were here. So in those cases, you're not in control. The, the wildlife comes in and comes out and goes as it please. So if you happen to capture an image while you're there, there's no penalty points because you were in a refuge. It's not like the animals got an email and posed for you. They, they happen to live there. You happen to go where they're at because that's the smart way to do the work. So that I wouldn't worry about. You don't need to identify that ever. But if you're working in a zoo, you know, j just don't try to pass it off as something you did in the wild because people will know. And I used to work in a lot in controlled conditions because for money, it's okay to work in controlled conditions if you're not doing photojournalism. But uh, I, I ended up shying away from that because I began to get uncomfortable with how some of those operators worked that ran those places. And I started moving to strictly working in the wild. Uh, Thomas Magnuson has written extensively about this. If you want to hear about, you know, the ethics of it from somebody's point of view that feels very strongly about it. Um, the other thing, guided tours. If you want to go on a wildlife workshop, that's the easiest way to get access because if you're working with the right tour leaders, they've got this down. They know where to go. Uh, Rich came up with me while we were on a workshop in Alaska. Uh, Rich, how many eagles did you see? Uh, I think I probably saw a good 300 over the course of the week, maybe more. Um, yeah. Yeah, I, uh, I got many a good photo, and uh, it was all because you guys knew where to go and uh, also when to shoot. So, yeah, it was one of those things where I was able to focus on technique rather than finding a subject to practice with, you know, it was okay. I was 
put it this way. I was able to make plenty of mistakes on my first uh, wildlife trip, uh, dedicated wildlife trip, and still get results I was very happy with, looked fantastic printing, and even licensed a few. Yeah, that's the cool thing about uh, going on a guided tour. You're with people that know what, where they're going. They know exactly where the animals are. They know exactly how to find them. They know exactly when to shoot them. It, that's most of the battle for those of us that do this work on a regular basis. If that's done for you, then you just get to walk up and it's like it's like Disneyland. You got you got subjects everywhere. So if you've got the money, go on a guided tour. That will increase your chances of success uh, immensely. But I do, again, re recommend starting at a zoo. Uh, this is not a zoo. This happens to be at the National Bison Refuge in Montana. And uh, this is what happens if you get a little too close to a bison. You get this look on their face, which is something that looks like it's out of a video game from a monster. I won't forget that. And uh, I stayed on the other side of my car just in case. Um, get great shots at the zoo. There's the, the simplest thing you can do, most people don't think to do this, but if you go up to one of the docents at the zoo, and say, is there any programs where you're going to bring some birds out and put them on a, a tether, or you're going to bring some snakes out, or you're going to feed the animals in a way that we can go on a special photo trip? The docents are there because they love the zoo. That's the reason they're there. Most of them are volunteers. They're there out of love. So nothing makes them happier than figuring out a way to make you happy and to get you what you want. So just ask the docents. I've gotten remarkable access at zoos because I've simply asked. Occasionally, there's a, a small fee, like at the San Diego Zoo. You can pay for a special photo trip that takes you around the back part of the zoo where you get to go places where the people that are traditional zoo visitors don't. It's well worth it. You get access, and access is everything when it comes to wildlife. Uh, another trick is simply walk up to the, the, the people who work at the zoo and say, hey, I want to photograph the bear. When is his feeding time? Because, frankly, most of the time you go to look at an animal in a zoo, they're sleeping or they're hidden because that's their natural behavior. But trust me, they know when feeding time is and they will be out and about when that happens and that's when you get your best shots. And also, if you're in a zoo, sometimes you're gonna have to work through glass or at least fences, but even though it may seem crazy to you, you can shoot right through that glass or right through that fence simply by putting your lens right on it. It's, it's outside the lens's depth of field on the short side, so it simply doesn't show up. It's a cool trick. When I first tried it, I was skeptical years and years ago, and I've used it many times since. It absolutely works. Get right up on the fence and and let your lens touch it. Don't be afraid of that. Would and something like shoot. a circular polarizer or anything like that help with the glass, or just you just go right up to it and you don't even need that? Uh, I, I don't usually need that because there'll be few reflections if the lens is right on the glass. I sometimes will use a lens hood to just protect the lens a little bit. But if you're careful about this, I've done it hundreds and hundreds of times without any ill effect, Rich. So uh, most of the time, you're not going to be dealing with glass. Most of the time, you're going to be dealing with a wire fence. And in that case, it just disappears. If you look at your depth of field and you'll see everything from three feet to infinity is in focus, well, guess what? The fence is two inches from you, so that's less than three feet, so it's not in focus. Uh, it, it's definitely not a factor in terms of stopping you if you get right up on it. But if you're even six inches back from it, then it starts to soften the image. All right. Uh, this is a picture of a wolf howling, and uh, we're going to get into the post-processing part of this deal. Now, I just tell you, my bias is pretty simple. I like to get things right in the camera because I'm old. I used to shoot in the film days when we didn't even have Photoshop, and there was no option for fixing it in post. You either got it right or you didn't. And when you were spending a quarter of a slide and traveling around the world to make these images, it was very important you knew how to do that. So I am personally, even though I know how to do it, I've even written a book about how to use Photoshop, I still prefer to spend my time with my my index finger on the camera trigger, not on a mouse. So when it comes to post-processing, I'm a very, very strong minimalist. Another reason for that is in nature photography, when you're demonstrating what you actually saw, it's very important to stay true to the scene. And, and, and there's a very big difference between that and art. Art, you can make anything, anything. But in nature photography, with a photojournalistic bent, you want to really make sure you're accurately representing the scene. So I like to use perfectly clear because the thing that most strikes me about it is 
it works with the data that you've captured. It's only going in there and looking at the pixels you've provided. It's not making any new ones. It's not like most of the other plugins or filters you use where it's actually altering the photo. It's simply going in and working with what you got. So everything it does, it does to what you provided it. I think that's great. It works with either Lightroom or Photoshop. I prefer to use it in Photoshop as soon as I'm done talking here in a few minutes. Rich will show you how to use it in Lightroom. It works the same way. Um, it's very fast. Uh, the computer I'm showing this on today with all the stuff I got going on on it, it's still going to run perfectly clear very fast. It's just a MacBook, um, but it, it's it, this has very low overhead, this program. Uh, so it doesn't take forever to load. It doesn't take forever to render. All of its corrections are blinding fast compared to some of the other filters that you may have used. So uh, with that, by the way, before, before I get into the... Uh, the stuff. This is how you can contact me. This is how you can contact Perfectly Clear. Uh, also, remember, we're going to have a replay of this webinar up at photofocus.com. Rich, when do you think we'll do that? Uh, actually, immediately after this webinar, within about uh, 15 minutes, the post will be live on the original Google Plus page and on YouTube, so it'll be on the PhotoFocus YouTube channel. But typically, we wait about two, three days, and then we run a follow-up post. Any questions that people had, and for example, you can post into the Q&A pod right now if you're watching this. Just feel free to ask some questions. Or after the event, if some questions come in, we'll do a follow-up post answer some of those questions, put that in. And so that'll probably be out Tuesday of next week. Uh, so you'll find that. And uh, we'll also embed the slide share presentation in there. So those links that Scott gave you to some of those different products that he was recommending, you could check those out. And remember, whenever you go to a place like Amazon, if you click on a link, it'll say things like, people who bought this bought this, and you find other good things. Or you know, it'll yeah. show you other alternatives at other prices. So Scott was just sharing the gear he likes. Uh, I've followed many of his recommendations through the years. Scott is the type of guy who likes the gear that's in the middle of the price zone, not the premium stuff, but the stuff that's going to, you're going to buy once, it's going to last, it's a good value. So um, he's got good taste, I guess I'll say. Oh, thank you, sir. Thank you. All right. So now what I'm going to do is get out a keynote here. And I'm going to open up Photoshop. And I'm going to bring in an image. And this first image is of a, uh, actually a, a wolf in Minnesota who happens to be standing on a waterfall. That's pretty good luck, isn't it, Rich? Yes, it was very nice that he stood there and was staring back at you. How far away were you, Scott? <laughs> I'm pretty far away. I'm with the, the 3 to 800 again. So I'm going to bring this image into perfectly clear. Now, you can do that by simply going to Photoshop you know, filter and loading perfectly clear. If you had it uh, already running, then you can use Command Option F on a Mac, and it's Control something on a Windows machine. Those of you who use Windows will know what I'm talking about. Control Alt F. That's just a great way if you're using a filter. A lot of times, you can press that shortcut. It opens up the last filter you used, and you can reinvoke it. Yeah. So I like to work with the image as big as possible. So I'm going to click the Expand button here. By the way, all the way down in the bottom right corner is a very important tool. This little button here allows you to zoom out or in on the image and pick the area you want to work with. And then simply putting your cursor over the image and holding down on the mouse, you can slide the image to get the area you want to see. And uh, that's kind of a cool feature. I'm going to work left to right here to show you the interface. So up here is the perfectly clear logo on the left. We're going to scroll all the way to the right. First thing to notice is you have different views. You can see this as a full preview, or you can go to double view. And on the left, in this case, is the original image I brought in. And on the right is the initial automatic correction by Perfectly Clear. And that's the first thing I want you to understand about this program. It's all about automatic. It will do all this stuff quickly. That's like 15 corrections just by opening it. You save so much time. And remember, my preface to this was I'd rather have my finger on the sh on the shutter button than the mouse button. So for guys like me, sometimes this is enough. The photo's already dramatically improved. It was a little bit underexposed because 
in my excitement at finding a wolf on top of a waterfall, I didn't necessarily have time to get my camera set up the way I wanted. And I made a rookie mistake and underexposed it. But look what happened perfectly clear without me doing anything already made it pretty great. So I can also split this, uh, you know, in, in different ways. It's totally up to you how you like to work it. I prefer to go with this view, the full view, and here's why. If I simply bring the mouse cursor over here and press down and hold, you'll see the original image. If I let go, you see the new image. So if you like to do that A-B comparison, for me, that's the easiest way to do it. You can also do that holding the space bar down. It's brilliant. It just very quickly shows you where you were and where you went right off the bat. Uh, now we're going to go over here and we've got these presets. I wouldn't get too caught up in what they call these things. After you use this program for a while, you can see how they all work. But there's details, there's vivid, beautify, which is traditionally used with portraits of people, fixed dark, which in this case it wasn't that dark so it didn't need it, fixed noise, there's no tint really here to speak of, and landscape. So those are your basic presets. You can click this box below here, and you can see that I have made my own presets. Uh, and you can do that too, and we'll just cover that in a minute. Then down here we have the navigator window, the OK button and the cancel button. You click the OK button if you want to make the correction and send it back to Photoshop. If you cancel if you decide not to. Let's go back up here to the top. I use the details preset. Now here's where the, the, the program is brilliant. If you're new to this stuff and you don't want to learn anything more, find a preset. It's sort of just a simple comparison thing like you might be used to in Instagram or any other application and you're done. I mean that's already a good correction. Again, I'll press down the mouse button. There's the before, there's the after. Notice all the things it did. It corrected the exposure. It made the colors pop. It made it just a little bit sharper. Look at the detail down here on the left side of the wolf. You can see his hair sticking out. This is brilliant. This is just bring it into the program. Boom, it's done. So for a lot of you, that's all you need this thing to do. And there's no shame in having this automatic correction. I would rather be shooting. So if this will do this good a job for me and I don't have to sit there and tweak it, why would I care? But if you are the kind of person that wants to get in and have complete control, Perfectly Clear makes that available through this Adjust tab. Now you see the sliders. If you're scared of sliders, stick with presets. If you love you some sliders, well, here they are. Here's the whole bunch of them, and I'm going to quickly go after them. The very top is one of my favorites, Opacity. You can slide this down in real time as if this were sitting on top of a layer to see how much or how little of this correction you want. Maybe this is too bright for you, so you can back it down to like around 80. That's your control point right there. You can just see what it's like in real time. Now the exposure is automatic, and you have a choice between low, medium, and high. High is definitely too bright for me. Medium is pretty close. If I didn't want any of these auto ones, I could simply grab this slider and do it manually to wherever I wanted it. I kind of like the medium preset. So I'm good to go there. Now, depth. You can turn that off or turn it on. When you're using the depth, you have two choices. High contrast, which is going to favor making the blacks and whites pop, and high def, which is going to favor everything else. Again, this is simply salt and pepper to taste. Do you like that version or that version? If you like this version, do you want a little less of it? You can use this slider to control it, or you can just turn it off altogether. But I like the way it kind of darkens the picture, so I'm going to go with that. And by the way, folks, this this photograph is, I don't know, more than a dozen years old. So uh, it was made with like a 3.3 megapixel video camera. <laughs> so it came out pretty good. Now everyone thinks you have to have a 50 megapixel camera to get a good image. This was made with 3.3, and it's a little noisy by today's standard, but certainly not in any way that would bother me. There's a skin and depth bias you can use, which does affect the image, whether or not there's skin. So that's why I'm saying don't. Don't get too caught up in the names of these things. I actually like the way it darkens the background, so I'm going to use that. And then there's vibrancy. Now, this is not in any way, shape, or form like the vibrancy in Photoshop or Lightroom, so don't be confused. This is perfectly clear's version of vibrancy, which just does what it says. It just makes everything that, that you want pop and everything not. Below it is fidelity, which has standard and vivid. This relates to color. 
So the standard colors versus vivid, you choose whichever one you like. On this particular photograph, I think the vivid looks better. Now you can dial in tint correction. There's a little bit of a tint here, which we can take out, but it's very minimal, so little that they don't detect any uh, tint at all in the automatic correction. Sharpening definitely helps, and I like to use noise with it. And then I can, again, control, am I gonna preserve the details? How strong do I want the noise to reduction to be? I had a little noise in this part of the photograph. You can see that this just knocked it right down. I happen to think that the photograph uh, looks pretty good right now. And part of the reason is, is I think the sharpening and the noise reduction in Perfectly Clear are superior to that that I'm able to use in Lightroom, Photoshop, or for that matter, almost any other program. Now, no program's perfect. There's gonna be the occasional image that, that this one doesn't handle as well as Lightroom might, et cetera. But more often than not, I get much better noise reduction and much better sharpening out of Perfectly Clear. And if I wanna look at that more closely, you know, I can zoom in on this again, just use this little slider and bring it in. And then I can click this sharpening on and off. And it might be hard for you to see on your screen at home, uh, but there's definitely a, an impact on the sharpness here that I really like. Now, there's all this stuff for portraits and eyes that I'm just gonna turn off because I don't need any of it with this image. If you're happy to, to work with people photos, this stuff down here is brilliant and it really helps. But in this particular case, I don't need anything more than what I got. I'm, I'm pretty happy with this image that started with this blah, uninteresting, underexposed, no color popping stuff to that in just a few keystrokes. If I like this preset and I have a bunch of shots from this same day, what I can actually do now is make my own preset. I can call it Wolf and say Scott's Wolf preset from the wolf on the waterfall shoot and click OK. And now go back to the presets tab and you can see that there's my wolf preset we just made. And I can use that on all the other images that I bring in from the wolf shoot. Pretty cool. Now, I'm going to go ahead and cancel out of this one. We'll work on a different kind of photograph. I'm not going to save that. This is really quite easy. So um, not, not, not much I can do to help that photograph. But that's me all geared up doing this kind of work. You see, I practice what I preach. There I am with my think tank rain cover on. This is in Alaska. Uh, and yes, some of my stuff's camouflage. It rarely matters. The wolf or the bear, or whatever you're shooting, probably knows you're there. But I, I can't improve that picture because I'm in it. So I'm going to keep moving. And uh, all right, here we go. This is an immature bald eagle. And uh, I think Rich was with me when I made this photograph. This is up in Alaska in a place called China Poot Bay. And uh, we'd gone off the boat onto a little spit of land and this guy landed right close to me and then decided he wanted to stare me down. Bald eagles are brown in color till they're four or five years old. That's when they get the white crown on top. So that's how I know this is a juvenile bird. I'm gonna bring this photo into perfectly clear using Command Option F for filter because that's gonna call up the last filter and notice that uh, I had used this in full screen, perfectly clear, remembered that. And so whatever you, your last use case was, it's going to go there. Now, this is one of those cases where I'm going to use the fill, uh, fixed tint correction. Notice I put my hand on it. There's a little bit of a, a cast. This brings out the blue that I saw in the sky that day. That's all I really wanted to do this photograph. And I wanted to show you that that's all it takes sometimes to make an image better. This it's got a little bit of a cast. This pops, and it, all that stuff was automatic. All I did was bring it in, click the, the preset, I'm done. So it's literally that fast. I'm now out of that picture. It's that simple. That is about the length of time, by the way, that I like to spend on a photograph. I, I, don't, I don't like to spend a lot more time uh, on an image than that. All right, let's work with this. This image is also a wolf. And uh, this is also in Minnesota. This wolf is swimming in a lake. I'm using my 800 
millimeter lens to get this shot. And again, I was so excited. I'm like, oh my God, there's a wolf swimming across the lake that I didn't check and I made a rookie mistake and I underexposed the image. And normally I just have to throw this away. I'm going to just show you real quick. Rich will get into this more in a minute. I'm going to hit Command J to make a duplicate layer. So if you wanted to be able to make your corrections to just a part of the image, you could work on a duplicate layer, create a mask, or simply erase it. Just wanted to remind you, all that stuff still works. As long as you're in Photoshop to begin with, then Command Option F, I'm going to bring up perfectly clear. And this is the automatic correction uh, right here, details. Let's look at that before, after. Look at that. It's just so much better. Let's go with vivid, before, after. Now, I could select fixed dark, but it wasn't dark. It was merely underexposed. So I actually think the details looks pretty good or the vivid. I'm going to go to adjust now. And I'm looking at this exposure wise. I may actually just be okay with that. Just a, a subtle change in the exposure. I kind of want to go right there, I think. The depth slider, see how it, it, it just makes it more 3D. The skin and depth bias doesn't really impact things that much here, but it's a slight uh, change. Vibrancy, definitely. Look at that. That's boring. That's cool. Fidelity changes the color, remember. So in this case, I don't really like what's happening with the color, so I'm going to turn fidelity off but I'm gonna turn tint correction on, very little tint, so no big deal there. Again, the sharpening and the noise, the same thing I did before. We can zoom in and see there's plenty of detail. This is again made with a 3.3 megapixel picture. I'm gonna turn off all this stuff for the skin, portraits, and eyes. That's the before, that's the after, way faster than I would have ever done it if I'm working in Photoshop. All right, we'll do one more. And then I'm going to have Rich take over, and Rich is going to show you how to do this with smart objects and how to do it in Lightroom. I hope you're, you're seeing how quick and easy this is. It's extremely powerful. It's not changing pixels. It's simply working with what you give it, and that is the most important thing. So let me get up here and get this guy. Hit command zero. Oops, sorry. Hit command. This is a big coastal brown bear. This is a, this is an adult male. Uh, you never want to see this guy if he's hungry. This is up near the same place in Geographic Harbor, Alaska. We're going to call up the perfectly clear filter, and I don't think this picture needs much, frankly. But if you look at this. And then again, this is a 3.3 megapixel digital camera. If you look at this before, notice how subtle that correction is. I hope it shows up on your screen at home. If it does, then you realize I didn't do anything but bring it into perfectly clear and I could call this good. But if I wanted to work on these things like details and vivid, I might like the vivid a little better because it brightens the picture in the right place and darkens it in the other places. These are one button corrections, folks. And if you start at a good place in particular, perfectly clear is the place for you to go. There's so much to learn uh, and very short time. We have to go here pretty soon. Rich is gonna take over for the last few minutes. I do want you to notice down here on the bottom left, there's an about and a help section and a watch tutorial section where Rich, by the way, and several other folks have tutorials and links to other webinars on how you can use perfectly clear. I hope you found this interesting. I'm at Scott Bourne on Twitter if you have questions, and we will once again have this all up on PhotoFocus. Rich, I'm going to ask you to take over and spend just a few minutes showing an import from Lightroom and showing a smart object so people get that option. And with that, we'll conclude the webinar. I hope everybody enjoyed it. I'll yeah. to you, Rich. But let me okay. just do that one more time, and hopefully Google will stop auto-switching, folks. Now, you're seeing a terrible echo there. So here's what we had done there. Uh, we had taken an image. And I'm not sure where we left off, but let's just do two of these images really quick. Uh, we had a thing here, and in this case, we had a great Arctic fox. You had talked to us about this before. We had made it a smart object, and then I ran perfectly clear. And what was awesome about perfectly clear is it made it really easy to bring out some of those details. I just went with details, and it just found the white point. It really helped there, and I love that. And I said, you know what, a little more depth, 
And let's favor the brightness there. That looks great. A little sharpening to just pop those hairs. And it's looking great. And I love everything about it, except the eyes got a little bit dark. But because this is a smart filter, it's easy to come on over and just paint with black to restore the original photo. So we can bring some of that detail back. So smart objects allow for really intelligent masking like that. And we can just make it easy to bring out parts of the photo. So that was that example. And then on the Lightroom side, we showed you that we can have an image selected and either say photo, edit in, and hand off just to Lightroom this way, edit in perfectly clear Lightroom. And that's great. And if you're just a Lightroom customer, that'll open it up in the perfectly clear interface. You can do what you want. Or you can edit in Photoshop. And this allows you to hand it off, takes any Lightroom adjustments you made, you're in Photoshop, and that's great. But what I'd love to do, instead of that, I'll say photo, edit in as a smart object. And now it opens up in Photoshop as a smart object, meaning that you can work non-destructively. And so it's pretty cool. We can go in, we can tweak things, we can bring out results. Notice there, I'm using the exact same settings as the Arctic Fox. I'll just pop up the vibrancy a little bit. Looks nice and rich. Open up the exposure tab. Before and after really pops well. And it updates. And if you want, you can put that inside another smart object again. This time, after it nests it, you can make a selection using a tool like the quick selection tool and just paint over your subject that you want. There we go. And I'm just making a selection on that tiger. Sorry to repeat myself, folks, but apparently Google had switched screens on me, so I want you to see that real quick. There's that selection. Click Refine Edge and tell it to use a smart radius. It'll clean it up a little bit. You can click OK. That's great. Any areas that we missed, we just paint again. And now, when we invoke Perfectly Clear again, it's going to look like it's applying it on everything, but it's actually not. And so I can sharpen with a second pass so that that fur is just really lifelike and popping through, and it comes through. Now, if you overdo a filter, no big deal. Like there, I pushed it too far. I could just come in here and back that off a little bit. It looks really solid. Click OK, and it updates because it's non-destructive. So you can continue to do that. And when you close and save, once that's saved successfully, and it closes the file, when I switch back to Lightroom, it added it into my Lightroom library, which is pretty awesome how that works. The last example I showed, I was working on some of my own eagle images that Scott helped me make. And uh, what I love is that even if the image is a little bit noisy, it can clean it up, pick up that strength, nice sharpening. And even with a little bit of the vignettes that I didn't want, if you just look at the before and after, it's just bringing out the details. And that's what I love, and that's why it's called Perfectly Clear. So hopefully that gives you guys some ideas. Hopefully that second time the screen sharing actually worked and uh, everybody was able to see it. So thank you guys for pointing that out. I'm sorry I was in the middle of full screen and you couldn't see it. Did everybody get it that time? Did somebody comment in the Q&A pod that they did see my screen? So I know it's okay. All right, looks like you guys did get some stuff. So good, you're able to see the screens. All right, excellent guys. Thank you guys so much for joining us. A big thank you to Scott as well. And we will have a replay of this up. We'll also uh, tune out and take out some of those other things. So thank you guys and uh, awesome, all right? Thank you, Scott, again. Anything else you wanna to say okay. to say goodbye? Nope, just uh, thanks to everybody for watching. Thank you again, guys. I'm the publisher of PhotoFocus. My name is Rich Harrington. And thanks to the folks over at Perfectly Clear for sponsoring this webinar and letting us do some great free education to help the photo community.